36-year-old Suzanne Pohl lived in Adelaide, Australia in 1993. She had a husband of 10 years named Daryl and two children, Melissa and Adam. Suzanne worked at a stationery shop on Salisbury Sands in McDougall. One late night in 1993, Suzanne was busy working. She always worked the night shift. When she did not arrive home at her usual time, her husband Daryl got concerned and drove over to the shop to see what was going on. When he made his way inside, he found Suzanne's body. She was lying on the floor on her back. He tried to see if she had any pulse, but noticed her hands were cut. Daryl then tried to give her mouth to mouth and took rolled up paper out of her mouth to try and revive her, but it did not work. She was gone. Investigators collected blood samples from the crime scene that belonged to the perpetrator. They stored it so that it could be used later when DNA was more advanced. Investigators theorized that Suzanne tragically lost her life in an intended robbery of the store. No witnesses came forward and investigators found no viable leads so the case went cold for many years. Recently in 2019, with much more advanced DNA technology, investigators took another look at the case. Using DNA, investigators found a relative of the suspect. After some more investigative work, they believed Matthew Donald Tilly was responsible for what happened to Suzanne. They followed him and saw he threw a takeaway coffee cup in the trash. Investigators collected it, did some more testing, and it was confirmed that he took Suzanne's life. He was arrested in September of 2019. At the time of the crime, back in 1993, Matthew was aged 21. His mother lived just streets away from the crime scene. He worked at a service station around that time, but records no longer existed to determine whether he was working the night Suzanne's life was taken. Matthew's trial started in late 2021. His lawyer, Jane Abbey, told the jury there was a real chance the evidence and DNA had been contaminated over the decades. She also said no witnesses saw anyone matching Matthew's description in the area, and there were no fingerprints matching his at the crime scene. Furthermore, she claimed that Matthew had no visible cuts or injuries after the crime, so the blood found at the crime scene could not be his. Prosecutor Carmen Mateo told the jury during the trial the DNA showed Matthew was 100 billion times more likely to be the matching person than any other human. The Supreme Court jury took just four and a half hours to find Matthew Donald Tilly guilty of the crime. Justice David Peake formally sentenced 49-year-old Matthew to life in prison. Daryl told the court that Suzanne had repeatedly said she would never put her life in danger if the shop was robbed and would always give thieves money or whatever they wanted. Suzanne's family sobbed loudly when the guilty verdict was handed down. Outside of the court, Suzanne's daughter Melissa Pohl said that she had never thought for a single second that the person who took her mom's life would be found after all of these years. Suzanne's son said that they can now move on with their lives. It is 28 years we haven't had our mom and our kids haven't had their grandma, but we're moving forward. Seventeen-year-old Alexis Tiara Murphy lived in Nelson County, Virginia in 2013. On August 3rd, Alexis left her home traveling to Lynchburg, Virginia. She was last seen at a Liberty gas station in Lovingston, Virginia on the evening of August 3rd. She was driving a white 2003 Nissan Maxima. In the following days, her family reported her missing and a search was launched. Three days later, on August 6th, her car was found in Albemarle County where it had been abandoned in a theater parking lot. Four days later, on August 10th, investigators announced that they were trying to identify photographs of persons seen in close proximity to Alexis. They looked at gas station surveillance footage and found that a man named Randy Taylor was at the gas station at the same time Alexis was there. The police searched Randy's trailer, where they found a strand of Alexis's hair. As he lived close to a river, dive teams and canine units conducted a search and found a red sweater. The sweater was initially speculated to have belonged to Alexis, but an investigator later stated otherwise. Several cell phones were also found and sent to the FBI lab in Quantico for testing. After another look in Randy's trailer, investigators found DNA evidence that Alexis had been there. On September 24, 2013, Randy was arrested in connection to the case. On May 1, 2014, Randy's trial started. He pled not guilty and stated that Alexis was in his trailer but she arrived with another man, Damian Brown, in order to buy weed, and that the two had left together. Randy's lawyer, Michael Hallahan, argued that law enforcement did not fully investigate this claim and focused predominantly on Randy, 
despite Damian Brown leaving the state shortly after Alexis disappeared. Evidence against Randy included testimony from a cashier at the gas station, a bloody t-shirt, the strand of hair, a torn fingernail, and a diamond earring stud. On May 8, 2014, Randy was found guilty. He tried to bargain for a lesser sentence. He said a third person had been involved and that he would reveal the location of the body in exchange for a 20-year sentence. His offer was declined. On July 23, 2014, Randy was given two life sentences. Randy requested that investigators perform a DNA test on Jesse Matthew. Jesse has been linked to several cases we have covered on the channel before, such as Morgan Dana Harrington. Investigators ran tests but found no link between Alexis and Jesse. In December 2014, Randy filed an appeal claiming that he did not receive a fair trial and that he received poor representation. His appeal was denied in May of 2015. His second appeal was denied in February 2016. In the meantime, the search for Alexis's body continued. On December 3, 2020, remains were found on private property in Lovingston, Virginia. The remains were transported to the Central District Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Richmond. It was positively identified as Alexis Murphy on February 5, 2021. The identification of the remains was not announced publicly until February 17, 2021, to allow Alexis's family time to grieve and make proper arrangements. The Murphy family released a statement thanking law enforcement officers for their commitment and unwavering support to find Alexis. Y'all kept the promise made in 2013 to bring Alexis home. Fourteen-year-old Regina Krieger lived in Burley, Idaho in 1995. She was last seen alive just before going to bed at her home on February 27th. The next morning on February 28th, Regina's father, Dan Krieger, reported her missing when he couldn't find her anywhere in the house. He found lots of blood on the basement floor and it looked like something had been dragged up the stairs. A month and a half later, on April 15th, 1995, Regina's body was found. Her body washed up on the bank of Snake River, near the Minidoka Dam, in the south central part of the state. Investigators and people in the community believed that Dan could be responsible for taking his daughter's life. He had to take a polygraph test. The results to the test were inconclusive because he was very emotionally distraught. No evidence belonging to the person who took her life was found and no witness came forward in the initial investigation, so the case went cold. Then in February 2019, Gilberto Flores Rodriguez was arrested in connection to the case. Three witnesses had come forward. The first witness, Cody Thompson, said that he saw Rodriguez enter Regina's house. Then, after half an hour, Rodriguez came out with Regina's body wrapped in a blanket. Thomas and Rodriguez then drove to the Minidoka Dam with Regina's body in the trunk. Once at the dam, they threw her in the water. Thompson says he later learned who they disposed of, but claims he was scared of Rodriguez so he stayed quiet for years. The second witness told investigators that she was at a party when Rodriguez arrived with Thompson. Both appeared to be upset and visibly stained with blood. When confronted, Thompson told the second witness about what had happened. The second witness also told investigators that she saw Rodriguez and Thompson bury a knife in a box somewhere on the property. The third witness claims that Rodriguez told him what had happened inside Regina's house. Apparently, Rodriguez told him that Regina fought back. The witness also claims Regina is not the only life that Rodriguez took. In May of 2021, Gilberto Rodriguez was found guilty. He was given the life sentence. He still denies that he was involved for anyone wondering why he did what he did. Regina's mother, Rhonda Hunnell, testified at the sentence hearing. In February 1995, you took something I cherish, a piece of my heart. My daughter's spirit surrounds me daily. Thirty-six-year-old Rita Desjardins lived in Denver, Colorado in 1994. On December 6, she was staying at the Broadway Plaza Motel. A worker at the motel had gone to check on Rita on December 6, but thought she was only sleeping. The next day, when workers got no answer from her room at the motel, they again went inside and found that she was not alive anymore. Investigators quickly arrived on the scene. They found that she had been strangled by someone. They collected a palm print and fingerprint at the crime scene that could belong to the perpetrator. A witness told investigators that the first time they knocked on Rita's door, they saw a black man's hand poke through the curtains, then saw a black man leaving the motel room shortly afterward. In November of 1995, detectives in Denver said the palm and fingerprint details were not defined enough to make a comparison, 
and the bed sheet they were made on was sent to the FBI. Nine years later, in November of 2004, a Denver Police Department captain asked the crime labs to test items found in the motel for DNA. Then, in March 2018, detective took swabs from a gin bottle found at the crime scene and another item and submitted the samples to the combined DNA index system. A couple months later, a match was made with Stephen Cumberbatch in Virginia. Denver arrest records showed he had been arrested about a month before the crime, two blocks away from the Broadway Plaza Motel. Later that year, a pair of men's shorts was also submitted for testing, which came back in September of 2019 with a partial match to Cumberbatch. The next month, a special agent with Virginia State Police authorized a warrant to obtain buckle swabs and palm prints from Cumberbatch, who was incarcerated at the time. Investigators then went to the prison where Cumberbatch was housed at the time and obtained swabs and prints, which were matched to existing evidence and other latent prints. In 2021, Stephen was arrested and extradited to Colorado. He is now awaiting trial.